Dr. Oshfeld is the founder and director of the Cardiac Wellness Program at Montefiore. He is modeling his program after Dr. Paul Esselstyn at the Cleveland Clinic. He's associate professor of clinical medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He's associate director of the Cardiology Fellowship at Montefiore, and I'm Montefiore Einstein. He earned his BA from the University of Pennsylvania, graduating summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa. He has his Master's of Science in Epidemiology from the Harvard School of Public Health. And he has his MD from Yale University of Medicine, but then went back and completed his medical internship at the residency at the hospitals for Harvard Medical School. So I often wonder when he goes to a game, like, who is he, who is he here for? I'm not going to put you on the spot or anything, but um, I would very much like to introduce Dr. Robert Osmos. Thank you so much for that incredibly generous introduction. Okay. And uh, thank you all so much for coming. It's great to come up to Chapel Club. I just noticed that the trees just starting to turn. It's beautiful. And I appreciate you all spending some time away from the farmer's market here in the morning uh, with, with me here. Uh, so I'm so excited uh, to be here. And so we're going to talk about confessions of reformed cardiologists, a plant-based diet in your heart. You know, my story started when I was pretty young. Uh, I had a couple of brothers who died from incurable disease when I was a kid. And ever since then, I've been moving toward going into medicine. And so one thing led to another, and I became a cardiologist. Um, and I had the chance to work with really incredible people along the way while I was training. But I learned nearly nothing about nutrition. Certainly nothing about plant-based nutrition. So when I finished up all my training, I learned tons about medications and procedures, and you know, maybe a Mediterranean-style diet. And so I finished up all my training, and I come down to Montefiore in the Bronx to start to work. And I did all the things that I was trained to do procedures, medications, and you know, Mediterranean-style diet. Like, I couldn't really define exactly what a Mediterranean-style diet was, but I kind of knew it was good, sort of. So, but people started getting a little bit better, but not a lot better. Um, and the inevitable march to more and more disease kept on going. Um, you know, it's another stent, and then it's another stent, and then it's bypass surgery, and then it's heart failure, and then you know, it gets worse and worse. So I was really starting to get disillusioned. Like, what am I doing? Like, I didn't go into medicine to get people just a teeny bit better. I wanted real transformational change. And so it was right around then. And honestly, if you had told me about plant-based nutrition when I finished my fellowship, I honestly would have thought it was weird. And so, but it was right around then that I learned about the impact of plant-based nutrition. Someone gave me the China study. Wow, this makes a lot of sense. That's the great book, evidence-driven book about plant-based nutrition. Like, wow, this makes a lot of sense. And so then one thing led to another and started our cardiac wellness program at Montefiore with the goal of preventing and reversing disease with a plant-based diet. And now I've been a cardiologist for 14, 15 years. And outside of the medical emergency, like somebody gets shot. And as we put that together again, I've never seen anything come close to the breath and death. The benefits that a plant-based diet provides. I, I literally have patients crying tears of joy in my office. And like just this week, uh, one one clinic session this week, I saw uh, one uh, person whose LDL bad cholesterol fell 92 percent just on a plant-based diet. I actually called the person up and I'm like, are you sure that you're not sneaking like Lipitor? Um, and she said, no. And so that was amazing. And this other person I saw um, who had really, really bad cholesterol blockages in their heart. And they, they people were begging uh, the patient to have bypass surgery, begging the patient to have bypass surgery. But the patient didn't want to have it. And that's cool, you know, the patient's the boss. So 
Um, he was on meds and then he went on a plant-based diet. Fast forward eight months, the guy went from walking like a block or two, walks over a mile, lost 25 pounds, cholesterol plummeted, hot plummeted, high blood pressure gone, and he never had bypass surgery that he was literally begged to have. And he, and I saw another patient, this I guess seems more mundane in the context of that, lost 25 pounds, high blood pressure gone. And that's just one morning. Um, and I, you know, I bumped into some colleagues, this is a number of weeks ago, before the seeing these patients, I'm like, when's the last time you saw someone lose 40, 50 pounds, come off five, six medications, reverse their diabetes, blood, their cholesterol plummet, high blood pressure gone? Like, when's the last time you saw it? And they're like, never. We never see that. Well, now, and I used to never see that, but now I see it all the time with plant-based nutrition. Um, so there were a couple, so I want to share a story of a couple of patients. Uh, so this is, there are a number of patients we had along the way that helped me feel like we were on a good path. And this is one gentleman I want to share. He uh, was about 60 and he started having chest pain and he would get it, he, first was walking around and sometimes even when he was sitting still. And he, he had a stress test with his local doctor, and that's where they run on a treadmill and showed that there was evidence of poor blood flow, heart muscle blockages in the blood vessels that feed the heart with blood. So they wanted to do uh, cardiac catheterization, and maybe put in a stent, but he said, no way, um, I don't have anything stuck in me, so no procedures, patients the boss, and he wouldn't take any medications, nothing. Not even an aspirin, no medications. So. And then we met him, and you can see he was a little overweight, body mass index of 26, normal 25, his LDL bad cholesterol was high, borderline blood pressure, and he could walk like one to three blocks and then get chest pain. So all we had left to do was put him on a plant-based diet. So now, just so we're on the same page, I mean, if something has a face or comes from something with a face, don't eat it. So tons of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, I feel like beans, lentils, chickpeas, peas, tofu, uh, some walnuts. And you know, basically that's what we had him eat. And what we're going to do is a little later circle back to this guy and see how he did. Now, I want to talk a little bit about how common this problem is. And when I say this problem, I mean cholesterol blockages in the blood vessels that feed the heart with so I'd like a uh, little audience participation. So what percentage, ballpark, of 12 to 14 year olds in the US have early signs of cholesterol disease in the blood vessels that feed their heart with blood? 75. Got 75. 70 to 20. Got 70 to 20. 90. 90. 90. So, and no one's gonna do like a price is right. <laughs> So okay, so <clears throat> somewhere between 20 and 90, so you guys are absolutely right. And that's really good work. Right? Um, but actually you're way better than the medical students I typically work with because usually they give me somewhere between zero and 100%. <laughs> but they're like professional test takers, so. So um, you guys are absolutely right. It's about 65. About 65% of 12 to 14 year olds in the US have early signs of cholesterol disease in the blood vessels that feed their heart with blood. And we know this from pathology studies of kids who died for other reasons. And you know, this is an incredibly common problem. Cardiovascular disease, heart and blood vessel disease is the num well, number one killer of adult men and adult women in the US. Women are about six to seven times more likely to die from cardiovascular disease than they are from breast cancer. Now clearly you do not want either one, but it highlights how important heart disease is for women. And about two heart attacks happen every minute in the US. A heart attack, of course, is when part of the heart muscle dies from a cholesterol blockage. So I don't know, maybe I've been speaking now for 10 minutes, so that's 20 heart attacks. 20 heart attacks have happened in the last 10 minutes we've been speaking. And this is a very expensive proposition, about 300 plus billion dollars a year. And half of heart attacks happen in people 
with, quote, normal cholesterol levels. So in our country, where it is normal to die from heart disease, I think our entire notion of normal is completely off. So OK, we're going to talk a little bit about why this happens, the pathophysiology. We'll take a little bit of a dive into some data. And then I want to talk a little bit about plant-based nutrition in practice as well. OK, so this is a picture of an artery. This is a normal artery, the center where the blood flows, the wall of the artery. This is the, uh, this little brown line, that's the endothelial cell. Um, it treats your blood vessels well. We want to take good care of it. We'll take a deeper dive into that cell, just put it in the back of your mind. And because I went to medical school, I can tell you that this is normal and this is abnormal. <laughs> I don't know if there are any young practice time. I had a couple of nods. I know I'm aging myself. All right. Um, okay. So, and you can see here, there's a teeny tiny hole for where the blood flows through. So, um, and you can see why someone may use some chest pressure. There's just a teeny tiny hole for the heart to be fed with blood. And so you may know people that go for a walk, they get chest pressure, they take that pill under the tongue. You know, and then the discomfort kind of goes away, and then they walk and they have to take another pill, it just keeps repeating itself. Well, that's the kind of disease that they have. And of course, we want to prevent that. And this reminds me, I really want to give a very special thank you to Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, um, who's been an incredible friend and mentor to our program, um, and also pe people like like me doing this today, we really stand on the shoulders of giants like Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Campbell, Dr. Barnard, Dr. Ornish. So a real debt of gratitude to their really groundbreaking work. Um, so this is, these are arteries. And this is the center of the artery with blood flows. These little yellow dots, those are cholesterol particles. They look all friendly here, actually. So this is the wall of the artery. Um, and what happens is that little thin brown layer, that endothelial cell, it can get injured. And whether it's smoking or inflammation or a toxic Western diet, um, it will get injured. And when that happens, these little cholesterol particles can then burrow across the wall of the, uh, across the endothelial cell into the wall of the artery, exactly where you do not want them. And when that happens, these little particles, they'll get oxidized and act like a splinter. Like, have you ever had a splinter and it gets all red and inflamed and kind of painful? Well, it's the same sort of thing, except in the wall of your blood vessel where you do not want it. And when that happens, that creates inflammation and free radicals and oxidative stress it makes the artery sicker every second of every day. It injures the endothelial cells more, then more of these particles burrow across, get oxidized, calls in more and more cells, and this grows and grows. And what happens is there's this teeny little white line, it's called the fibrous cap. And that's the only thing that keeps all of this cholesterol from touching the blood. Who cares? Well, you don't ever want those two things to touch. Because this cholesterol, from this, if it touches all of um, the, the blood here, it can make it clot and block off the artery. So what happens is with all that inflammation, all those free radicals, the white line gets thinner and thinner, the fibrous cap gets thinner and thinner, the blood is rushing by each heartbeat in one random Tuesday afternoon, boom, it cracks. And then all this is exposed to the blood, clots off the artery, that is a medical emergency, that's a heart attack, and when that happens, you want to stent right away. You may have seen those medical drama shows like ER or whatever, if they rush someone, oh my god, they're having a heart attack, take them to the cath lab right away, that's what's happening. The fibrous cap is ruptured. This is a picture of that. This is an artery. Uh, this is all the cholesterol on the wall of the artery. That's the little opening that was left. The, the fibers cap cracked, boom, clawed off. Obviously, this person did not survive. This is a heart. I don't know how long it comes through. These, this is one of the arteries that feeds the heart with blood. You can see all that. That's a clot. Um, and the person had a very large heart attack and died. 
So I thought it would be interesting to just take a look at what happens with a heart before and after a heart attack. So um, I want you to focus your attention here. This is the left ventricle, the part of the heart. And if you've ever felt your pulse, you know, in your neck or your wrist or something, you feel your pulse and you know, it beats like once a second or so. Well, what's happening is this part of the heart squeezes, pumps blood to your body, and that's just feeling. You're feeling your pulse. That's what's making your pulse happen. And you have to take my word for it, it's all the walls moving, it's squeezing normally. That's normal. Just keep that in the back of your mind. So I thought, well, I want to get a picture, another ultrasound picture of the heart, but after a heart attack. And I didn't look in our system in any organized way, but it took like two minutes to find one, because it's unfortunately incredibly common. And so here, you can see the whole top part of the heart doesn't move. This person had a giant heart attack. Um, he's lucky to be alive. This is what we want to do. So, okay. So I work at Montefiore Health System. These are the boroughs of New York City, and we're here in the Bronx, actually in Montefiore now, as I'm sure many of you know, is spread into Westchester and Nyack. Uh, but I'm based here uh, in the Bronx at uh, one of the, the big Montefiore hospitals. Now, the, uh, the Bronx has a, um, about a population of a little under 2 million people. And we serve a, there's a large indigent patient population there. About 85% of the patients from the Bronx who come to Montefiore are on some degree of public support. Um, so we're honored and privileged to be able to help take care of this population. Um, and I think that's the context of our program getting a little ahead of myself. So what I want to talk about now with our, with our cardiac wellness program is plant-based nutrition and practice. We'll talk about how we have our inpatient program, some educational initiatives we're doing, a little bit of research, and some next steps to hope that we can hopefully all take. And one thing I'd like is you know, maybe each of you could think of a specific health goal that you may have. You know, maybe you want to lose a few pounds, maybe you want to come off a few medications, maybe you want to reverse your diabetes. But put that goal in your head and keep in mind what we're talking about today, how that may be able to help you achieve that goal. And then when you leave today, you make it happen. And hopefully some of the things we are going to talk about may help with that. So, the, uh, the health, Montefiore Healthcare System is, it employs about 40,000 people. I think there's about 10 or 11 hospitals as part of the system now. And I talked a little bit about the demographics of, uh, the, um, of the Bronx. So plant-based nutrition in practice. Um, the, I remember the moment when I really felt like I needed to start this program. I was moving in this direction. It was one random Sunday morning and I was on call in the hospital. And I was sitting at one of the nursing stations and about to go see a patient. And it was a really beautiful Sunday morning, and I'm kind of feeling a little sorry for myself being in the hospital. But uh, so the, uh, was, there was a patient I was about to see who had had a, a heart attack in the middle of the night, and the cardiac catheterization guys had come in and saved her. They put her in a stent in the middle of the night, and they saved her. And it was wonderful. Um, but it seems to me at the time that those were the people that I, only people that I knew who were really saving people's lives, the people who were coming in at three in the morning, putting in stents, doing procedures. So I thought there has to be a better way. We have to prevent this in the first place. So that's kind of when I had my aha moment. And so what did we initially do? We created this outpatient program where I see people in clinic and I weave in plant-based nutrition into every uh, visit. And I see two main categories of people. The first category of patient is just the person who comes to see me, they're plugged into the Montefiore system, and they need to see a cardiologist. And that's a very interesting group, because they usually don't know anything about plant-based nutrition, but they somehow wind up in my office. And so when I bring it up, they look at me like I'm from Mars. <laughs> um, and there's quite a steep climb from there to getting them plant-based. And there's another group of patients I see who are interested in plant-based nutrition. They're usually starting at second base. We have less activation energy for those patients. So what do we do in clinic? How do we make this thing happen? Well, you, got, you, you go see your doc, and I'll do the same thing that that, that, that doc does. We'll do a history and physical, uh, go through your medications, allergies, your past medical history, all that stuff. But then what we talk about is, 
that we desperately need to make you healthier. And the most important part of that is how you're living your life, your lifestyle, how you are eating. Um, and I'll ask patients, are they interested? And they often are, and we'll ask why, because we're trying to find a hook. What can we do to bring that patient in? They want to stop the blood pressure meds. Do they want to look good for an upcoming reunion? Do they want to lose 15 pounds? Whatever that hook may be for that patient, we try to use that to help them adopt this healthier lifestyle. We set very specific goals. Um, we will have routine follow-up where we have various metrics that they can follow for accountability, such as weight checks or blood pressure checks. We follow certain labs. Um, we also give patient handouts with a roadmap of how to live this way. This is an example of one of them. And what we'll do is I'll say, look, I want you to have at least three servings of green leafy vegetables each day, three servings of fruit each day, three servings of other vegetables each day. And I actually move my hands around like that in a slightly weird way because I want them to remember it. Um, and then we give them these checklists where they can actually check it off. Um, we have a, very, a variety of handouts. And this one is how to transition your home into a disease-fighting powerhouse. Very sexy sound. <laughs> and so, but the clinic is not enough time to get into this information. It's not enough time. So what we do is we have these periodic cardiac wellness program sessions on, on Saturday mornings, uh, periodic Saturday mornings. And they're about four or five hours where we take a deep dive into the how and why of plant-based nutrition. Much more time than we have in a typical clinic session. And so I speak, a nutritionist speaks, we serve lunch, we ask people to come with a friend or a significant other, and there's a very large indigent patient population um, in the Bronx. So we don't charge patients for it, I fund it all through uh, donations. I want to democratize this information as much as possible. And we serve, we serve lunch. Um, and this is an example of one of the lunches that's actually delicious. This is a potato curry stew that we serve, and quite frankly, it is honestly my most favorite food ever. Uh, I love it. Uh, these are some open cookies. Okay, so that's a little bit about our Saturday mornings. Uh, what I'm going to do is sprinkle in some evidence along the way of why eating this way is good. So I like to think about it by taking a world tour. And so let's go to where heart disease is not to get a clue as to why that may be. So we'll take a bit of a world tour. And our first stop is in rural China. And so that, that's where the Great China Study uh, was done. It's in the 80s. And what they looked at about 6,500 people all throughout China. And they took tons of health metrics. They had very detailed food information. And what they found is the fewer animal products you ate, the less disease you have. And it just kept going. Fewer animal products, less disease. On and on it went. Um, and it wasn't just heart disease. It was cancer. It was inflammatory diseases. It was bone diseases. OK, but maybe that's just rural China or you know, back in the 80s. Let's jump to China today. <laughs> and so this is an amazing study where they looked at what happens if you eat more fresh fruit in China. What happens if you eat more fresh fruit? And they looked at over 450,000 people for over 3 million person years of follow. If you follow me for one year, that's one year of person follow. That are 3 million years. And what happened if you eat more fruit? You did better. The more fruit you ate, the less cardiovascular disease, the less stroke. Um, and it just, the more you ate, the better you did. And so, fruit is your friend. And I'm getting a little tired of hearing people talk about how fruit causes diabetes. Um, and I should, the thing I forgot to mention is in that study, they found that the more fruit you ate, the lower your blood pressure was, and the lower your blood sugar was. So I'm getting a little tired of people mentioning how fruit causes diabetes. But the good news is this group did another related study in that same population of over 450,000 people. And they looked at what happened if you did not have diabetes when you started, if you did not have diabetes, 
and you ate more fruit, what happened? Well, the more fruit you ate, the less likely you were to develop diabetes. Well, what if you had diabetes at the beginning of the study? You already had it, and you ate more fruit. What happened? Well, the more fruit you ate, the better you did. Okay, so let's bounce to South Africa. This is a really interesting study done by Dr. Birkin, and he noticed that the South African black population, which ate predominantly a plant-based diet, seemed to have very low rates of Western diseases, like, like bowel and colon diseases and heart disease. He wanted to quantify it a little bit. So he went to this hospital in Johannesburg, where the South African black population would get admitted. And about, there were about 40,000 admissions each year for about 10 years. And 40,000 admissions a year. And he looked over 10 years. So about 400,000 admissions over 10 years. And he looked in the chart and he said, okay, how many cases of heart disease do we see here? Do we see 100,000? Do we see 5,000? How many cases of heart disease do we see here over 10 years, 40,000 admissions a year? Okay, so they found 30, three, zero, cases of heart disease documented in the medical chart over those 10 years. I can take you to the cardiac floor at Montefiore right now, and there are more than 30 cases of heart disease right now. Okay, let's bounce to Europe. This is the EPIC study, and they looked at about 20,000 people, followed them for about eight years, and they looked at four healthy lifestyle measures. Not being overweight, regular exercise, not smoking, and having a reasonably healthy diet. Not as healthy as I want my patients to eat, but reasonably healthy. And if you had all four versus none, you had about an 80% lower rate of a chronic disease like heart disease, diabetes, cancer. Okay, let's bounce to the US. This is a pretty awesome study. Hopefully it comes through okay over there. And this was about 200,000 people, 4.8 million years of follow-up. And what did they do? What they looked is they looked at how people ate. They said, first of all, if you eat a plant-based diet versus an animal or Western-based diet, who did better? Shocker. If you ate a plant-based diet, you did better. But then what they did is they split the plant-based diets up into a healthy plant-based diet and an unhealthy plant-based diet. In the unhealthy plant-based diet, because you can eat, you can be plant-based and have sugar cookies and white flour and white bread and cake um, and be plant-based. No one's going to argue that that's healthy. And they looked at that in more detail. They found that if you ate the unhealthy plant-based diet, you did about the same as someone who ate an animal-based diet. But if you ate a healthy plant-based diet, you did much better. Oops. Okay, now we're going to bounce down to the U.S. and Canada. This is the Seventh-day Adventist study. And they looked at about 60,000 people. And the Seventh-day Adventists, it's a religion, they treat their body like a temple. And what they did is they, they have many healthy lifestyles, so they were able to parse it out. So they have many vegans, and lacto-vegetarians, and pesto-vegetarians, and semi-vegetarians, and non-vegetarians, and what they decided to do is to look in each group and see what the percentage of diabetes is. And so what they, and even the non-vegetarians, the people eating more toward a Western diet, in the, uh, with the Seventh-day Adventists, they eat much more healthily on average than a typical Western person does. So what they found is you can see the group with the lowest rate of diabetes was the vegans. All right, let's bounce to Europe, uh, to England, which, I don't know, I guess it's still part of Europe, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is the very famous heat surveys, uh, otherwise known as health surveys, uh, for England's time. <laughs> And so, um, the, uh, so what they looked at here is about 65,000 patients over about seven years. And they looked at servings of fruits and vegetables per day. What happens if you have more fruits and vegetables? Um, how do you do? So they found that the more servings of fruits and vegetables you had, shocker, you did better. You lived longer. It was associated with living longer. Not just stroke, not just heart disease, but death. 
It was associated with living longer. And they kept on going, five, six, seven, but they couldn't look beyond seven servings a day because so few people did that, that the statistics fell apart. Okay, let's bounce to the US. This is the Cardia study. A very, very interesting study. They looked at about 2,500 people. Um, and at around the age 25, and they got baseline dietary information. And they put people into thirds of fruits and vegetable consumption. Lowest third, middle third, higher third, fruit and vegetable consumption. And then what they did is they looked 20 years later. They got a CAT scan of the heart looking for cholesterol disease in the heart. And they said, okay, well, what happens? How do you eat? It turns out that if you're at 25 eating at the highest third of fruit and vegetable consumption, compared to the lowest, you have about 26% lower odds of developing heart disease 20 years later. It's never too early to begin, and it's never too late to start. I have patients in the 80s who start eating this way and do incredibly well. In fact, I have this one guy who started eating this way. He lives way upstate in New York on a farm, and he went from being short of breath walking a couple blocks, and now he works on a farm. He's like the most ripped guy you've ever seen. It's really amazing. So, okay, I want to circle back to what we do in the Bronx. So what typically happens for one of our patients, they adopt, let's say they adopt a plant-based diet, and it's great. So usually, within about one to two weeks, their clothes are looser, because they're losing weight. They're, they're, they, particularly if they're on blood pressure pills, I will not uncommonly get a phone call that they feel lightened. And what's happening is that we're making them so healthy, they don't need as many blood pressure pills anymore. And then we're lowering the blood pressure so much, they get lightened. So we start to lower the dose of the blood pressure pills. If they're on insulin, their insulin requirements are falling. They need far fewer units of insulin. And if they have chest pressure, it usually start from cholesterol blockages in their heart, it usually starts to improve. These are things that we see usually within one to two weeks. <coughs> cholesterol levels fall. I don't really know how quickly because I don't usually check them before like three months. Um, and weight um, typically falls usually very quickly at first, and then it kind of levels off with a slow fall, and then it sort of stabilizes. That's the typical pattern that we see. Here's some data from our clinic with cholesterol. This is just, I think, about 40 patients. And you can see for this group that went to some degree plant-based, the uh, LDL bad cholesterol fell over 20 points for them. So, so what are some other common benefits that people see? That the things that I'll typically hear in the first follow-up is it got more energy. They're thinking more clearly. They're sleeping better. Very, very common. But there are some not uncommon things that I'll, that I'll hear when someone starts to develop, start to eat a plant-based diet. And one thing, it's not that common, but they'll say, I feel a little weak, feel a little sluggish. And what that usually is, is because eating a plant-based diet is incredibly nutrient-dense, but it's not calorically dense. So sometimes people will eat a similar volume of food, and they're not getting the amount of calories that they may need. So then we just have them eat more, uh, have another serving for dinner. Like quite literally, I will sometimes have three servings for dinner. Um, and then that takes care of the problem. Other things to keep in mind are if someone's on Coumadin, a blood thinner, or if they have issues with potassium or if they're on insulin, we have to have very careful conversations with them uh, because we can interact with those issues. Many people are on Coumadin, eat plant-based, or take insulin, eat plant-based. We just have to do it carefully. So if that's you, please be sure to talk to your doctor before considering this. Um, another not uncommon issue is other physicians and healthcare professionals. Now, I've never seen anything come close to the breadth and depth of benefits that eating this way provides. But unfortunately, uh, you know, I didn't learn about this in medical training. Uh, things are changing, which we'll dive into, but I didn't learn about it in medical training. And lots of other physicians and RDs and nurses and stuff didn't learn about it either. So I can talk about it, but then they'll come back and say, don't have primary care doctors, so I shouldn't do it, or my nutritionist, so I shouldn't do it. And it's sort of like a one-by-one -one discussion. You have to just uh, keep uh, dealing with that. And so we'll preemptively uh, discuss that before they're in the office. 
So how about some unexpected benefits when people start doing this way? I see that all the time. Usually, someone has one benefit that they just never thought would happen. They had a chronic skin issue, a little rash or something gets better. I've had a number of patients who have really bad prostatitis or inflammation of the prostate. They've tried all kinds of things, and after going plant-based, it went away. I can't unequivocally prove that it was a diet, but that's the only thing that changed and made it better. Uh, cystitis or uh, an inflamed bladder, which can be very, very uncomfortable. Headaches, irritable bowel, various types of chest pain, um, and uh, a couple of patients whose heart failure had uh, sub substantially improved after eating this way. So it's usually it's very, very common. So now this is a great study. This is bouncing back to the US. And in this study, of about 130,000 people with about three and a half million person years of follow-up, they asked, what happens if you replace 3% of animal proteins with 3% of plant proteins in your diet? If you replace 3% of your animal protein, with 3% of plant-based protein, what happens? Well, in this study, it's associated with living longer, just 3% of the calories. But they had enough data here, they could break it down by type of food. How about if you replace 3% of your calories from processed red meat with 3% of the calories from plant-based protein? That's associated with a 34% lower hazard of death. How about unprocessed red meat, 12 Poultry, 6%. Fish, 6%. Eggs, 19%. Dairy, 8%. All significant. Processed red meat now by the World Health Organization is considered a class one carcinogen in the same category, I believe, as plutonium. Okay, so there are some issues that as a medical practitioner we face one of them is time. I have 40 minutes for a new patient, 20 minutes for a follow up patient. And it's not enough time to dive into this stuff. That's why we have these Saturday morning sessions. But we do our best with the time that we have in clinic. One of the things that is very helpful is outsourcing information, outsourcing some of the teaching. So in addition to the Saturday sessions, I encourage all of my patients to watch the amazing documentary <coughs> film, Forks Over Knives. Um, and hopefully all of you can watch it, if you have not already. We have those handouts that we give people with very detailed plans. There are other things online, like the uh, Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group Quick Starter Guide. They have it in English and Spanish, you can download it. Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine has a 21-day Kickstarter, and also Dr. Esselstyn and Campbell have uh, websites as well. Jean has an amazing website, also tons of incredible information, videos, it's terrific. We create a specific plan for the patients. If it's vague, it won't happen. Um, and language is an issue as well. So we have some of our handouts in Spanish. So we will use that a little bit as well. Um, so what are some hurdles? Behavior change is one of the biggest hurdles. Like we all kind of know that eating kale is good for us, but getting ourselves to do it is another issue. Um, so we try to take a multi-pronged approach to behavior change. And if anybody here has great suggestions about behavior change, please let me know, because I would love to incorporate it. So education, of course, is one. We talk about it in clinic, Saturday sessions, setting very specific, measurable goals that people can be accountable for. Um, I have a very specific eating plan. We have weight checks or blood pressure checks that have overt accountability once a month or so. And when I follow up with people, I'll ask them, like, hey, if the way you used to eat is 0%, and whole food, plant-based is 100%, where are you? Are you five? I, and I'll make a little guess in my mind. You know, they're barely doing it. Like, are you 5%, are you 10%, are you, you know, are you 50%, what are you? And so we can follow that percentage. I know it's self-report, but you know, we do what we can. And those Saturday sessions, we encourage people to come with a friend or significant other who can help them along the way on this path. Another typical hurdle that comes up is what do I tell my doctor? Because not a lot of physicians know about this or are particularly supportive of it, which is to me an embarrassment to our profession. Um, but what, I'll, what we typically do is you want to try to make 
your physician think it's their decision. Um, and so what I typically encourage patients to do is to say, you know, I've, I've learned about this really interesting eating plan. I've tried it, and it's really been helpful for me. Um, and I'll talk, we'll say, here are a couple of very short articles, and I'll, we'll talk about which ones they should bring in. But I would, I would love to get your thoughts on it to see, to see what you think about it. So it's a great opportunity to educate that physician. And, yeah, and also, you try to make it seem like it's that physician's decision, so they feel completely empowered and, and invested. Like nobody wants to be like steamrolled, and so that could just be another uh, potential person who may be more open to this down the line. Another real issue is a split family. And interestingly, I have this in a number of uh, patients, but one really kind of stands out. This is a guy in his early 60s, bad heart disease, having chest pain, with not much activity. And he also had really bad prostatitis, too. He was one of the guys with prostatitis. But anyway, he went plant-based. Now he rides his bike for like two hours, prostatitis gone. Um, but his family makes fun of him for eating this way, which is weird, but that's just how it is. And so what they've come up with is that he has a cheat meal. Once a month, he has a cheat meal. And so once a month, he has a giant pastrami sandwich. And they all kind of rally around it. Like that's their kind of one day to share all that together. And then they, they're very supportive of all, all the other times. So that's the way that they're able to make it work. So you try to find something that works for you. Another issue is friends. You know, maybe your friends are sometimes, I mean, I mean, you see how it is. People get religiously, have a religious fervor about how they eat, which is curious. But anyway, um, like, if your friends are like, oh, you know, can't you just try this? Can't you just have that? And, and if they're really your friends, and then you explain to them why they should really let you eat this way, it's a wonderful thing, opportunity for you to, um, you know, introduce them to this. Going out to eat can be a hurdle, um, but the way that we typically work that is, if you know where you're going to go beforehand, you can go online, you can check out the menu. And if they don't have anything for you, what I typically do is I call up the um, I called the restaurant, I'm like, hey, I'm that guy. And uh, this is how I eat, what can you do for me? And usually they're incredibly accommodating. It's also like they've done the same thing every day for months. So to change it up, they actually, I found they get a little bit interested and excited about it. Um, and the other thing is if you don't know where you're gonna go and just kind of randomly go in some place, I look at the sides and the salads, those two sections first. I don't even look at the middle of the menu. I go to the sides of the salads, and usually you can get a baked potato, a salad, uh, usually there's something that you can work out. If you're going to an Asian themed restaurant, they usually have steamers, they can steam their stuff for you. So that's not too big of a deal. Cost always comes up as an issue. And I think it's very frustrating how as a society we subsidize ill health. We subsidize foods that do not promote health. It's very stilted system and you can think of the ripple effects of that with the climate and the healthcare industry and on and on it goes. Um, but less globally for the individual person, but we have many people on snap cards, which are the food stamps now, eating this way. And we'll say, look, you know, if we don't I don't even bring up organic. If you, if that's not a cost issue, go for it. But I don't even bring that up because it's just cost prohibitive. But what I'll say is, you know, um, you can go to a Costco or a big thing like that, get a huge sack of potatoes, a big sack of oatmeal, a big thing of frozen vegetables. It doesn't have to be fresh at all, some sauce. You know, that, um, that's a lot of meals right there. You can get big boxes of there are some healthy cereals. And if you buy these things in bulk, uh, there are farmer's markets, there are green carts that will take snap cards. You can make it work. Um, Access, that can be a hurdle sometimes. Some people are unable to get to these places, they don't feel safe walking there, and then it's working with friends, family, community organizations who may be able to step in and help you. Um, so, yeah, so an action plan. What do we do in clinic? Counsel every patient. Every patient <coughs> talks about it. We will outsource some of the education with the movies and the papers and the handouts, the weight checks for accountability and reinforce this every single follow-up. It's very helpful for patients when they realize that their physician or healthcare provider finds it important. Okay. 
What's the circumference of the Earth in miles? 25,000. Yep, about 25,000. So how many miles of blood vessels do we have in our bodies? 60. Two? So I've heard between two and 60. Um, and that does a great guess. Um, it's, it's actually about 60,000 miles of blood vessels in our bodies. So it's no wonder that if we treat our blood vessels well, we treat every square millimeter of our bodies well. And this is a picture of a blood vessel. These are uh, blood vessels, and these are the endothelial cells. You remember that one cell layer thick that the cholesterol particles particles can burrow through? Well, if I were to take all the, all the endothelial cells out of my body and lay them on the ground, that would fill up about seven tennis courts worth. We have a lot of endothelial cells. And when you eat a plant-based diet, you give your endothelial cells the fuel they need to be healthier. The endothelial cells make something called nitric oxide. NO or nitric oxide. Um, nitric oxide is your friend. Nitric oxide helps blood vessels dilate. So if I go for a run and my legs need more blood vessels, nitric oxide helps that happen. Nitric oxide makes the blood less likely to clot. Nitric oxide reduces inflammation and oxidative stress in the wall of your blood vessel. It is your friend. You want your blood vessels to be able to make that. When you eat a plant-based diet, you give them the fuel to be able to do that. Now, our blood vessel, our body turns itself over over time. Our skin, our heart, everything turns over over time, as do our endothelial cells. And our body makes these things called endothelial progenitor cells that come from the bone marrow and come out and then go and replace the old sick endothelial cells. So you want there to be good throughput there. And it turns out, if you make more endothelial cells, you do better. Endothelial progenitor cells, you do better. You can see here, this, this is a group of people with known heart disease, and those who made more endothelial progenitor cells did better. The ones who made the least did worse. Who cares? What can we do about that? Well, interestingly, it turns out that you might be able to make more endothelial progenitor cells. And they took what up to just a few months ago I thought was the healthiest population of people in the world, young Okinawan women, and they fed them either their usual diet or the usual diet plus more green leafy vegetables. And guess which group made more endothelial progenitor cells? The group made eating more green leafy vegetables. And the reason that I say up to a few months ago I thought was the healthiest population in the world is there was a very interesting study that came out of Bolivia published in The Lancet four or five months ago about the Somali population there, which is an indigenous population. And they had been very limitedly touched by the Western world. We'll ruin them soon. But <laughs> um, the, uh, and, and they have the lowest rate of heart disease ever recorded in the medical literature. And and it was, it's not just like a surrogate marker. They actually got CAT scans. They took 700 of them. They got CAT scans on their heart to look for the amount of heart disease. And it turns out that this population, compared to the typical Western population, their heart disease, the development of it, was delayed by about 26 years compared to us. What's different? Well, they were very physically active because they had subsistence living. But their diet was very different than ours. It was about 72% carbs. Yes, carbs. It was about 14% of the calories from fat and 14% of the calories from animal products. And the animals that they're eating is truly wild game, like they're catching monkeys um, and eating them. And interestingly, in that study, with 705 people, lowest rates of heart disease around, only about four or five of them had elevated blood sugar levels. Only about four of which would be associated with diabetes. And they were eating 72% of their calories from carbs, complex carbs. 
And Kant's art of hearing and complex carbohydrates cause diabetes. Okay, bouncing back to the Bronx. So we have an inpatient program as well. And when I used to like, round in the hospital, it means I see patients in the hospital, they're admitted, they're in the hospital bed, I go there, say hi, we try to work on their acute issue. And what I would do is I'd ask patients to eat a plant-based diet. And we'd go through it, and then what would happen is um, I would talk about it, and then five minutes later, dinner would be served. What's dinner is chicken. And I was totally undercut. So I'm like, this is no good. So we have to make uh, an inpatient program. And so um, what we did is, uh, working with nutrition and food services, we created plant-based meals for inpatients. So now, and instead of ordering chicken, you can order plant-based meals for the inpatient. But that wasn't enough, because you need some education and context. So you all get a handout when it comes. And also, the documentary film, Forks Over Knives, plays in the hospital for free for patients mm -hmm. to watch. Um, and that's been an incredible addition and a resource. And to my knowledge, we're the only hospital in the world that has that combination. Uh, so now I can walk into a patient's room, um, order the food, I know they're going to get a handout, talk about it, and have them turn on forks over an eye. So it gives, gives me, makes me feel like my plant-based posse is with me, and I have a fighting chance of planting a reasonable seed in them that they hopefully will take home and do. Um, and so, and this is a picture of some of the food we had a tasting. Uh, it's important to help spread the word through our system, obviously. So we had a tasting. These are just some of the food that we serve um, for the inpatients. And now it's, it's gotten to the, uh, our cafeterias. Uh, our cafeteria server that sells out, apparently, is what they're telling me, which is phenomenal. And Montefiore will be meatless Mondays fully, the cafeterias, fully by the end of this year. Of course, there's the environmental impact with that as well. But um, and it was so helpful. It was so, if any of you guys are part of institutions, bringing that on board was so psychologically helpful. And the reason I say that is the very first day of Meatless Mondays, there were a lot of complaints. People were like, you know, the, the employees, and obviously some people really loved it, but others didn't. 40,000 people work there, it's all slices of life. And so some people were like, God, you know, who are you telling me what to eat? Where, where's, where am I gonna get my protein? I'm so famished. You know, and, and, you know sort of some of that stuff is silly. But the, um, uh, but now it's like, oh, it's just meatless meatless. <coughs> no big deal. Oh, so now it's just like nothing. It's not a big deal at all. It's just so it just changed the psychology of the place. They saw that nothing horrible in the world was gonna happen with meatless Mondays. And now it's like, just okay, cool, it's because of it. That was a very nice psychological shift to watch. So, why do we encourage people, sorry, I asked some formatting issues, why, again, do we encourage people to eat a plant-based diet? Well, we did a bit of a world tour. We started talking a little bit about mechanisms in more detail. Let's talk about another one. Let's talk about something called trimethylamine oxide, or TMAO. TMAO is not your friend. It's an oxide, and the more you have in your body, the worse you do. Um, it's associated with dying sooner. It's associated with more heart failure, more diabetes, more cancer. Um, so, okay, so in this very interesting study, they gave people who were omnivores, meaning eat everything, or vegans, the steak. They gave them the steak to eat, and what happened? Well, it turns out the omnivores made a good bit of TMAO, or trimethylamine oxide, but the vegans made virtually none. What's going on? Well, what's going on is our gut bacteria is what's going on. And it turns out that if you eat an animal-based diet, you select for gut bacteria that helps lead to the formation of TMAO, or trimethylamine oxide. Uh, but if you eat a plant-based diet, you select for virtually none of that bacteria accounting for the difference. So, okay, well, in the steak, the, uh, the key compound was L-carnitine. It was L-carnitine in the steak that interacted with the gut bacteria that led to the formation 
of CMAL, which can be the cholesterol forming of the blood vessels in your body. Um, and L-carnitine is structurally similar to choline. Who cares? Well, choline is a required nutrient, but when you eat choline, um, you also can make trimethylamine oxide. And choline is in chicken. Choline is in fish. Choline is in egg yolks. Choline is in dairy. So when you eat those things, you are also making trimethylamine oxide. But the good news is you can get your choline from plants. You eat plants, you get your choline. Dr. Oswald, you just said, if you eat choline, you can make trimethylamine oxide. Well, that's true. But if you eat a plant-based diet, you select for virtually none of the gut bacteria that lead to the formation of TMAO. So you get the choline that you need, the dozens and dozens of other phytoplant-based nutrients that you need, and protecting yourself from developing trimethyl and oxide. Okay, here's a busy slide. So, one of the pushbacks I typically get is, oh, it's all in my genes. You know, my parents had it, my, it's all I'm just gonna get. It. Well, that's not the case. Genes are not your destiny. Fully, they matter, but not fully your destiny. Dinner is your destiny. <laughs> genes run in families, but so does lifestyle. So in this really incredible study, what they did is they created a genetic risk score. And they put people to three levels, low genetic risk, intermediate genetic risk, and higher genetic risk. The higher your genetic risk, not surprisingly, you did worse with cardiovascular outcomes. But you know what? It didn't matter whatever level of genetic risk you had, the healthier you were, the better you did. And so even in the highest risk genetic group, if you had what they defined as a healthier lifestyle, you had a 50% more risk of developing heart disease. And their healthier lifestyle, the exercise component of it was 30 minutes of exercise once a week. So and that got you into the healthiest group. You can only imagine how healthy you would be if the hurdle was slightly higher. But so genes are not your destiny, but dinner is. So, you know, unfortunately, we are um, up against some serious forces here. And, you know, football season's back again. And you all remember that great Super Bowl ad from last year about Rocky? Like, of course you don't, because there was no. <laughs> like, there's no big rock. Um, and so I thought, I'm like, all right, well, you can slice what I still know about the same in a lot of ways, but I took, I'm like, all right, let's look at the advertising dollars spent in 2004 by the top eight fast food chains, 2.3 billion. And there was at the time, some of you may remember this federal program, a five a day program, um, uh, 4.9, where the federal government was saying you have five servings of fruits and vegetables each day. And they spent about 4.9 billion. So I couldn't make sense of those numbers, so I changed them into seconds. 2.3 million seconds and 4.9 million seconds. That's 73 years versus two months. But times are changing, and we'll dive into that. But bouncing back to the Bronx, there's a very large educational component to my program. I had a, let me just jump ahead here for a second, okay. A um, very large educational component to our program as well. And this is a great quote. Uh, it's by a cardiologist, that's not the only reason why it's great. Um, it's a little long, but it struck me as a peculiar paradox that guidelines highlight the primary importance of nutrition and lifestyle, yet the physicians who are expected to implement these guidelines receive absolutely no education in these areas during the residency and subspecialty training. That's unfortunately incredibly common. That times are changing, they're shifting a little bit, but not anywhere near as much as I believe we need. I'll dive into that a little bit more. So some of the education, as our program, we've really had the opportunity to uh, write in various blogs, um, uh, various research articles about this to try to help spread the word. And we created this uh, special issue in the Journal of Geriatric Cardiology uh, with about 11 articles uh, all a theme issue focused on plant-based nutrition and cardiovascular disease. To my knowledge, it's the only such themed issue in the medical literature. 
Um, we get to speak a lot, such as today. We get to help train medical students. I give a medical student school class a lecture once a year. And the full class is part of the core curriculum. And also, this is great stuff, but I'm not sure exactly how it's going to go. Albert Einstein College of Medicine, the medical school that is affiliated with Montefiore, where I work, is, is revamping their entire curriculum. And I had the opportunity to present, and they said that they are going to weave nutrition education into their entire medical school curriculum, which is phenomenal. Um, and to my knowledge, it will be the first medical school in the country to do that. But the, um, every, all plans are on hold right now because the deans are turning over, they're switching deans. So uh, we'll have to see what happens. And everything's tabled at least until 2019. So, Fingers crossed we'll keep continuing down that road. We teach residents, we teach fellows. I mean, all my cardiology fellows learn about it. Get to be exposed to colleagues, the media stuff, and oh yeah, so the, um, we have a, a, a conference coming up on October 27th of this year at Montefiore. Love, love for you all to come. There's a brochure, I think that's handed around, we have more over here about it. Some of the people you will know, uh, Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Barnard, Dr. Kim Williams, Dr. Michelle McMacken, and others will uh, be there. Actually, Dr. Joel Kahn, some of you may know, will be a surprise guest. If you're not a surprise guest anymore. <laughs> um, and so I'd love for y'all to come, and that's the website to sign up for, the information is there. Um, and I'm funding this all through philanthropy. We fund a majority of our program through philanthropy. The Saturday morning sessions, our educational efforts, our conference. Um, I want to democratize this information as much as possible. So if anyone may be interested in being a sponsor of our conference, we have lots of ways that we can uh, do that. You can um, sign up over here. That might be here if you just want to learn more. Or you can talk to Maeve after, you can raise your hand after. Or if you're in any way interested in sponsoring our program or conference, we rely on that. Uh, to help our patients, so thank you for considering. Um, there are research aspects of our program as well. I'll quickly I'll, I'll move past that. Um, so next steps. What are some next steps? Only you can go that far, science. <laughs> but it's true. Um, you know, and I hope when you all leave here today, you'll circle back to that goal you have and make it happen. And you all have incredible influence in the communities around you. Uh, your friends, your families, your local organizations. And try to bring this there. Try to talk to people in your community. Share your success stories. Write a blog post about it. Make a YouTube video. We need more information about that out there. We need, for this movement in general, a more centralized rapid response PR team. Because there's so much mis and disinformation out there that it's helpful for us to have them. People like Dr. Garth Davis and Dr. Joel Kahn and Kim Williams are always out there in force helping to push back against all this uh, misinformation. We need to be proactive about it. I'd love to get nutrition topics on board exams. So if you want to get doctors' attentions, what the questions on board exams? Uh, we need to avoid the circular firing squad. Now what I mean by that, and this may happen a little bit more in the animal rights community than the health community, but like for example, Beyonce went vegan for a month. And she tweeted that. Now I can scream from the rafters until the end of time, and I will never come close to reaching anywhere near as many people as she can with one tweet. But there was a lot of pushback. Oh, she's not vegan enough, she's not vegan long enough, please. She's getting a message out there. And that's wonderful. So we have to stop the circular firing squad. And the second most important thing, after the most important thing, which is being here today, the second most important thing is coming to our conference. So, <laughs> uh, so let's circle back to our guy who said, I don't want anything stuck in me. I'm not taking any pills. I have heart disease. I'm not taking an aspirin, that nothing. He's the boss. How did he do? He went on a plant-based diet. What? Okay, so let's see, he lost weight, body mass index became normal. Blood pressure, normal. LDL cholesterol, plummeted. He's walking about a mile. This is about three or four, I guess it is, about three or four months walking about a mile. And oh yeah, this is to remind me about a study I want to mention. 
So if you went from walking one to three blocks to walking a mile, what is that? 12 more minutes, maybe? So there was a really uh, big medication that came out called uh, Renolazine. And what that medication was is that helps people with chest pain from cholesterol disease walk further. It's a really important advance. So if you would get chest pain, walking can help you go further and improve your quality of life. That's a really important advance. And the, one of the main studies that helped this medication get approved by the FDA helped people exercise for an additional 29 seconds. Okay? <laughs> this guy is walking for 12 more minutes. They're exercising another 29 seconds. But hey, this is a $300 million drug. OK. This is about a year later. Uh, he jogs two miles. Cholesterol looks good. Blood pressure is great. He, I saw him probably about six months ago. He jogs about five miles now and stops because he gets bored. <laughs> so you know, the question that I typically get from this is, yeah, you know, he's doing great. Um, he uh, you know, lost weight, blood pressure is good. But what about the HDL? What about the good cholesterol that fell? What, so what do you say about that? So the first thing is, of course, we do not want to lose the forest for the trees, because the guy is doing so much better. But actually, it may not be a good thing. Now, HDL is kind of a double-edged sword. If you eat healthfully, it can be protective. If you eat unhealthily, it could be pro-atherosclerosis or not protective. And when you eat a plant-based diet, it is well described that HDL levels fall, but they may become healthier HDL particles. And there's something called efflux capacity. That's the HDL particles' ability to suck cholesterol out of the wall of the blood vessels. It's efflux capacity. It's a vacuum cleaner ability. And that capacity may improve on a plant-based diet. So when my patient's HDLs fall, I'm actually secretly happy. Because to me, it means they're doing this, and I'm confident that their HDL particles are getting healthier. Plants or burgers, you choose. This is a picture courtesy of Dr. David Alessandro, a former sleep surgeon. Oh, he's a sleep surgeon, formerly at Montefiore. Uh, he, this is a picture of bypass surgery. Um, this is someone around the back. This is their face covered by a towel. Their feet are down there. This is their chest. It's solid open. This is, these are protractors um, pulling open the breastbone. Now, it's great that we can do bypass surgery if we have to. It's absolutely great that we can do it if we have to. But we'd rather prevent it. And one thing that's interesting to me, this has been said, is when I go around and encourage people to eat kale, like some pushback that I'll get is like, I'm extreme. I'm so extreme that I'm encouraging people to eat a plant-based diet. Talk to some other people. Um, that I'm somehow extreme. Well, because I consider it extreme when someone saws open my chest, <laughs> stops my heart, takes a vein from my leg, and stitches it back into my heart. Like, when did the world turn upside down that this is perfectly normal and kale is extreme? <laughs> OK. So um, there's a great randomized, small randomized trial by Dr. Orange, Gene Orange. And he looked at this very small study, about 48 people with known cholesterol blockages in their heart. And he randomized them into two groups. One is usual care by their cardiologist, and the other one was an intervention group where they ate almost exclusively a plant-based diet, exercise, and psychosocial support. And they, what they did is they followed the size of the cholesterol blockages in the heart. And after one year, those in the intervention arm, meaning healthier lifestyle, the blockages shrunk. And those in the usual care group. And in five years, they continued. And, and the same theme. And those with a healthier lifestyle had fewer cardiovascular events. They did better. And not surprisingly, the healthier you eat, the more shrinkage they saw in the cholesterol blockages. You can see the healthier you ate, the more shrinkage that there was. Now, this is a great observational study by uh, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, where he looked at about 200 patients with stable cholesterol blockages. And their average age is about 63. They followed them for about four years. 
And about 90% were adherent to a whole food, plant-based diet. So of those adherent patients, 112 had chest pain. They improved in 104 of them. 27 avoided previously suggested steps for bypass surgery. And I've seen this many times in my clinic as well. And they lost on average about 18 pounds. And of those 177 people who had um, a recurrent event, there was about one. They concluded that one person had a recurrent event. That's an event rate of 0.6%. If you compare that to the 21 patients who did not adhere to the diet, they had a 62% event rate. That's 62 versus 0.6. That's subtle. Obviously not good. So this is a great example from Dr. Esselstyn. This is a patient of his he described uh, that was in his early 40s, uh, a surgeon, a fit runner, had chest pain, uh, was having a heart attack, got rushed to the cath lab. They had to shock him back. He died three times. They had to shock him back to life three times. And this is what they saw. This is a cardiac catheterization. This is the artery running down. And they inject the dye so it lights up and you can see it. And all this kind of like ratty area here, that's where the trouble was. But at the time, they couldn't put a stent, couldn't do surgery. But he survived. He was bummed. You know, a couple of young kids. He was thin, fit, probably was in good health. And so he didn't know what to do. So he decided to have a plant-based diet. He went whole food plant-based. But he said, I'm not taking any of those cholesterol lowering pills. OK, he's a boss. That's fine. Fast forward three months, three years, excuse me, he had a repeat coronary angiogram. And so then after the angiogram, he walks into Esselstyn's office and gives him a big hug. I've been a cardiologist now for 14 years. I've never seen any intervention, medication, lifestyle, anything come close to this other than a whole food, plant-based diet. Now, diet is a continuum. Uh, you can eat really poorly or really well and anywhere in between. The Mediterranean-style diet is indeed better than a typical Western diet. A large prey that study highlighted that. A typical a, a, a Mediterranean-style diet did better than a more typical Western-style diet. But interestingly, they a priority before the study happened said, we're going to look and see what happens if people ate more of a pro-vegetarian pattern, more plants, and see what that did. And what they found is that among omnivorous subjects at high cardiovascular risk, better conformity with a food pattern that emphasized plant-derived foods was associated with the reduced risk of all-cause mortality. Um, it also is associated with less breast cancer as well. So more plant-based foods, less uh, low associated with lower mortality. This is reinforced by the EPIC study, that study we talked about the four risk factors. For every standard deviation increase in fruit and vegetable consumption associated with a 14% reduction in mortality. In an article just out of the Journal of Medical of the American Medical Association this week reinforces that one serving of fruit and vegetables a day is associated with about eight percent lower risk of a cardiovascular event. Okay, there's a really cool study called the Courage Trial. That was really important in cardiac circles. And what that study looked at is they looked at people with stable cholesterol blockages. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because with stable cholesterol blockage is similar to Esselstyn's study. Similar to SL, I'm going to make a comparison. There's two different studies, apples and oranges, just hypothesis generally. But in the current trial, what they did is they took people with stable cholesterol blockages, randomized them to healthier lifestyle, please, or please be healthy, maximal medical therapy, versus please be healthy, maximal medical therapy, and a stent. And a stent, stable blockages, not a heart attack, stable. After five years, no difference. There was no difference in the groups. So the chest pain, if you had it, got better a little bit more quickly in the stent arm, but they caught up by the end of the study. So to me, a stent in stable disease is paralytic. <coughs> so that, that was an incredibly important study in cardiology. So all right, so what I want to do is compare Esselstyn's work to Courage. Hypothesis generating only. This is the plant base. Their total cholesterol started at 237 with statin and lifestyle. They got to 137. Kirch trial started at 174 and got to 141. LDL cholesterol was in the 70s in both studies. Look at the event rates. In the plant base, 26. In Kirch, 19. They had a 19% event rate, meaning heart attack, stroke, uh, other adverse events. 
what accounts for this difference? Well, I can't tell you for sure. My hypothesis is that when you get to an LDL in the 70s on a path that includes a plant-based diet, yeah, it's good for your cholesterol, but it's good for you for dozens and dozens of other reasons accounting for this difference. How about chest pain? Well, in the plant-based diet, it improved in 93% of patients. What about the Kurtz trial, which included stents, mechanically opening up blockages? 73%. Uh, how many procedures did they prevent in the plant-based arm? They prevented 27 procedures. How about in the Courage trial? Well, what I did for this at the back of the envelope analysis is I left out the initial group that got a stent, because sometimes people have to rush back with complications or something. So I thought, to be fair, I'll just look at the group that didn't originally get a stent. How many procedures did they prevent? None. There were 348 new procedures. How about lifestyle? Um, in the plant-based, they lost about 18 pounds and encouraged, they encouraged people to be healthier, and they gained about three pounds a swing of about 21 pounds. All right, busy slide, how to fix it. This it looks at people with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and they were randomized to a plant-based diet versus the American Diabetes Association diet. Guess which one won? Um, this is your health insurance. Obviously, said, let food be thy medicine, medicine be thy food. Uh, of course, exercise is uh, recommended and a part of our program. You cannot exercise without a bad diet, but it is definitely important. This is the Las Vegas Strip, and as you can see, nobody takes the stairs. But that's okay, because I went to the American College of Cardiology Conference <laughs> a few years ago, and I can't believe this actually happened. I'm not taking this picture. But times, they are changing. They are changing, because last year, I also went to the American College of Cardiology meeting, and one person was taking the stairs. Um, okay. So this is a cool slide. Let's look at nutrients in plants versus animal-based foods for 500 calories. Okay. This is cholesterol here. You don't need to eat a drop. Your body makes all you need. How about protein? Oh my god, my muscles are gonna fall apart tomorrow. <laughs> How about beta carotene? It's subtle. How about dietary fiber? Your constipation will go away. We have bones to keep us standing. Plants have fiber. How about iron? Oh my god, I'm going to become anemic tomorrow. Calcium, my bones are going to fall apart. What I forgot to say is, important. these are the plant-based foods, and these are the animal-based foods. The plant-based foods are equal parts tomatoes, spinach, lima meat, peas, and potatoes. And the animal based foods are equal parts beef, pork, chicken, and all milk for 500 calories. And uh, if you don't believe me about the fiber, you can take, or about the protein, take Patrick Babumian's word for it. Patrick Babumian is the world's strongest man. How do I know that? Because he won the world's strongest man contest. <laughs> and he also has a perfect name to be the world's strongest man, Patrick Babumian. So it all works out. He is vegan. He is plant-based. And the way he won that contest was he carried 1,200 pounds, 15 meters. So like a Mini Cooper down Fifth Avenue. Oh yeah. Uh, so one of the reasons that I'm very happy to encourage my patients to eat this way is the benefits that it's associated with. Eating more of a plant-based diet is associated with benefits in the, with a lot of different disease processes. So what I like to do, we're used to CAT scans where we look for a problem. Well, I thought, wouldn't it be cool to do a kale scan where we look for something good? So I have a kale scan. So I'm just going to go from the top. A plant-based diet is associated with living longer, with less depression, with improved cognitive function. Many of you are on social media. You may remember a number of years ago the ice bucket challenge for ALS. It's associated with less ALS, less stroke, improved skin complexion. And some investigators will say that acne is so tightly linked to the toxic Western diet that it's not actually 
a vestige of teenage tanks, but rather your body crying out for help from lack of nutrition. Fewer ear infections, less periodontal disease, less heartburn, less lung disease, less breast cancer, less heart disease, uh, less obesity, less diabetes, less constipation, less colon cancer, less prostate cancer, improved sexual function in men and in women, improved athletic performance, less bone disease, less lower back pain. I think I got those. That's some references to support that. Here's a cool study about um, animal protein and early cancer. This is great work by Dr. Colin Campbell. What he did is he created a rat liver model of cancer, rat liver cancer model. And what he did is he counted the number of cancer clusters and he adjusted their diet. So he created liver cancer and then he put them on a diet that's 20% casein. 20% casein is the protein in cow's milk. 20% casein. And you know what? The number of cancer clusters grew. He put them on that for three weeks. Then he switched them to a 5% casein diet. For another three weeks, the number of cancer clusters shrunk. And then he put them on 20% casein diet. For another three weeks, the number of clusters grew. And then he put them on a 5% casein diet. For another three weeks, the number of clusters shrunk. He could literally turn on and off the size of cancer by changing how, how patients ate. Cancer is increasing among meat eaters. This is incredibly interesting new work. Um, and vegetarians show the lowest mortality of all. This is from the New York Times in 1907. Um, oh yeah, this is cool. Uh, so this is work by Dr. Orders and some others. So they looked at prostate cancer. And they looked at early stage prostate cancer. We don't know what the right thing to do is watch for waiting surgery, so it's a perfectly ethical group to look at. And he took them and he put them on a healthier diet. Mostly, or a healthier lifestyle. Mostly a plant-based diet and some psychosocial supports and exercise. And he biopsied their prostates before and about three months later. And after the healthier lifestyle, three months, hundreds of pro-cancer genes were down-regulated in their expression. And dozens of anti-cancer genes were up-regulated in their, in their expression. Now, we can't change our genes, our eye colors, our eye color, our hair color, our hair color. We may be able to change which ones speak. And he was able, in this study, to help the healthier ones speak more loudly, and the unhealthy ones speak more softly. It's pretty mind-blowing. But it gets even more mind-blowing. In animal models, that on-off switch, turning the healthy genes on and the unhealthy ones off, those can be passed on in animal models to their kids and their grandkids. So what an incredible responsibility we have. Not only is what we choose to put on our fork gonna impact our health and the environment, but maybe the health of our kids and our grandkids. Times are changing. This is a great quote from past president of the American College of Cardiology, Dr. Kim Williams, and he's gonna be speaking at our conference. I recommend a plant-based diet because I know it's gonna lower their blood pressure, improve their insulin sensitivity, which, we, which means improving diabetes, and decrease their cholesterol. This is great. My myopic world, the American College of Cardiology is a big deal, so having this person uh, supported is very helpful. So today, no one can deny the possibility of adequate nutrition and the prolonged maintenance of health and vigor on a vegetarian diet. That's from the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1912, before the term vegan was even coined. So, I want to say thank you very much. Thank you. Um, this is our well, our wellness program website and our conference website. If anyone is interested in helping to support our program or knows someone who is or wants to learn more, please reach out to me. And I really appreciate the opportunity you all coming here today and the opportunity to speak to you all. So thank you. I'll be happy to take questions. Yes, sir. Uh, can you say a few words about atrial fibrillation? Yes, the question is can I say a few words about atrial fibrillation? Uh, it's incredibly common, uh, unfortunately, and as we get older, uh, it's more and more common. Um, 
And the issue with atrial fibrillation, one of the main issues, is it can cause stroke. Now, um, there's no unequivocal evidence that a plant-based diet can prevent atrial fibrillation. But my, um, and if someone has atrial fibrillation, uh, I do, either before you have it or after you have it, I think you should be eating, or someone should be eating a plant-based diet. Now, I'll dive into it more now. If someone's on Coumadin, typically when people have atrial fibrillation, they may be on blood thinner and help reduce the risk of a stroke. And if someone is on Coumadin, you should not change your diet until your doctors and your team know, because that can mess up your Coumadin level and put you at risk. But you can once everyone's on board. I have plenty of patients eating greens and on Coumadin. Um, now, various things that can promote atrial fibrillation, like high blood pressure, like heart disease, can be improved or potentially reversed with a plant-based diet. So a plant-based diet may reduce the future risk of atrial fibrillation. There's a very good pathophysiologic reason to think that. And we also know when someone has atrial fibrillation, they get uh, a special kind of zapping procedure to try to have it happen less. If they lose a significant amount of weight, uh, they um, uh, can, um, reduce their future risk of having atrial fibrillation. So although if you have it, it's probably not going to cure it. It may make it happen less often, and it certainly will have beneficial ripple effects. <coughs> yes, sir? Given your experience with the plant-based diet, uh, what would be your response to the Eskimo population who eats 100% blubber and has longevity into the 80s and 90s? And also the French paradox, where they're drinking lots of wine, eating lots of cheese or I think a lot of it is unpasteurized, uh, and, and also don't have the incidence of cardiovascular disease that we see here. So the question is, how do you explain the Eskimo population that reportedly has lower rates of heart disease um, and uh, you know eats largely blubber and the uh, or you know a lot of fish and the French paradox? Those are great questions. The Eskimo population, it turns out a lot of that data is not accurate. Um, the, one of the initial studies that put that on the map, um, the, they lived so remotely that by the time that they were actually seen by a doctor, maybe three or four days later, and the cause of death wasn't clear. They just put down cardiovascular disease on the reports, so, or, or the, the, the natural causes or something. So. Uh, a lot of that data is inaccurate. There was a very interesting study out of Canada, which I can't remember the reference, but they took a deep dive into the Eskimo population and actually found that a number of the older studies were inaccurate because of, of mislabeling. And newer evidence from this population actually showed that they had an accelerated rate of heart disease. And there's a similar theme with the French paradox. Um, and they may not exist at all. It may have just been labeling on death certificates, because there it's much harder to label cardiovascular disease and other things. And I don't know if you know how it works, but like when, if you're a busy resident on call at night, you've got a dozen things going on, you're not thinking about exactly what the cause of death was, per se. You just you know, put down heart disease, lung disease, something like that, um, so that you can get back to the dozens of other patients you have to take care of. And so apparently, it was easier to uh, not list heart disease and list other things. And that's been well described in the report, but I don't remember the reference off the top of my head. So it's postulated the French paradox doesn't is so actually. So you mean that one of these is autopsy based? Correct. Yes, sir. Uh, you kind of glazed over organics and didn't mention anything about GMOs. Is that something we just didn't have time to get into right now, or is that something you don't think is that big of an issue? Well, um, so uh, I figured people are probably already bored here, <laughs> but the. Uh, one of the reasons that I don't get into organics is because uh, where I work in the Bronx, there's a very large indigent patient population. And the, um, you know, so that could be cost prohibitive. So if organics is something that's not a cost issue, I think it's great. I, I would definitely encourage our patients to have it. But otherwise, it could be quite cost prohibitive, so I don't do it. But I do think, I think being whole food plant-based is way healthier than a typical Western diet and whole food plant-based plus organic is better yet. Um, in terms of the GMO, I'm not as, I mean, I haven't taken a full deep dive into that, but one of the, and I don't know that genetically modifying the plants per se is bad, 
But one of the things they'll do is they'll modify it so it can tolerate more pesticide. So you can spray it with tons more pesticide. The plant won't die, but it'll kill everything else. And maybe us too, with all that pesticide. I don't honestly know the answer to that. But I don't know, it makes teleologic sense to me that I don't really want to eat some kale that was bathed in pesticide. And so, uh, I mean, I'm with you on, on those, but that's not as far as I've gone. Yes, ma'am. Well, so the question is, how do you handle green leafy vegetables and uh, cumin and other maybe other range, other uh, supplements uh, like garlic? So the um, so before you make any changes, you definitely have to talk to your doctors, your medical team. Now I have plenty of patients who are on cumin and eat green leafy vegetables. Now cumin blocks vitamin K. That's how it works within the blood. Green leafy vegetables give you vitamin K. So those two things will duke it out. Um, but what you can do is, if you're working closely with your medical team, you can eat a similar amount of green leafy vegetables each day, and, um, and they would need to increase the dose of your cumin. And then you can have the benefits of both the cumin and also the green leafy vegetables. Now, you have to be careful about other things that can thin your blood, like aspirin or garlic, or a lot of garlic when you're also on cumin, because it's just going to make you that much more likely to bleed. Now, garlic is not going to be able to replace something like cumin. I don't know instance where garlic would be a sufficient blood thinner to replace cumin. I wouldn't do that. And if you're on cumin, it's important to be careful about uh, substances like that that could thin your blood, because it may make you slightly more likely to bleed. But, so I would definitely talk about it with your doctor, but the option to have green leafy vegetables and cumin is quite real. Quite real. Yes, ma'am. Um, nice to see you again. Thank you for your information. Um, I am just wondering. I guess uh, eggs, dairy, and fish are not. I'm looking at that graph. It looks like I mean, dairy is special. Yeah, the question is eggs, uh, dairy, and fish, and, and I encourage my patients to not have those. Um, the one I typically get a question about was is fish, and the reason for that is a fewfold. Uh, first of all, you know, what's the reason that people say fish are going to be helpful? They have omega-3 fats, and that's important. We need them. But you can get them from, um, you can get the substances, the raw substances from them, from hemp seeds, chia seeds, excuse me, flax seed meal. I encourage my patients to have two heating tablespoons of that each day. <coughs> and fish don't make omega threes; they just eat them. So you can just get rid of the meal, and they get them because they eat plants. Um, and you know, if you feel like you need more, there's a concern there are algae-based omega three supplements that some patients will have as well. So that's why. You know, that's one of the reasons people say fish is healthy, but you can get your omega threes in another way. And the reason that I think the unhealthy is fish and trimethyl and the oxide. Fish have all kinds of toxins in it. Like, the oceans are kind of accessible now. I mean, I don't mean to be melodramatic, but like, you know, there's mercury, there's dioxin, PCBs in there. Like, if you look at, you remember the tsunami by Japan a number of years ago and a nuclear reactor melted down? Like, if you look at these geothermal radiation maps, it like stretches all the way to California. So that you know impacts the food chain there as well. Uh, so there are a variety of toxins, and also you know the, there's cholesterol in fish, saturated fat in fish, which I don't support. And um, so that's why I, I encourage my patients to not have fish. Thank you. Two more things. Is uh, mentioned uh, coronary calcium is that calcification plaque? Yes, coronary calcium means cholesterol disease and blood vessels in the body, and the plaque or that cholesterol disease over time can get calcified. And if you have that in your arteries, that's by definition atherosclerosis in those heart, but that's in your heart, it's by definition <coughs> coronary artery disease. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. What do you have for breakfast? <laughs> what do I have for breakfast? So what I have for breakfast is, oh, I have oatmeal for breakfast. 
and I toss on some fruit, and I toss on all kinds of spices. Um, I encourage my patients to have lots of spices and pack with antioxidants. Um, and I'll, uh, sometimes I'll shake in like some cacao in it as well. It's great for antithelial function. I'll either moisten it up with water or oat milk, one of those replacing milks. I particularly like oat milk because I have a sweet tooth. And sometimes I'll pour in a little bit of, of uh, maple syrup on it as well. What spices do you put in? What spices I put in is, uh, so I put in cinnamon, I put in turmeric, I put in a little bit of cloves, um, and there's another one which I, I just got, which I'm lacking on the name of, uh, like the Indian world world berries. Garam masala. Cardamom. No. Amla. Cumin. No, I, I apologize, but the way I know this, the way I know about it is, well, I put barberries in as well, and the reason I know about these is because Michael Greger's incredible website, nutritionfacts.org. He had a video about the antioxidant contents of spices and stuff. And if you look on his website, the antioxidant capacity of barberries, which is very high, dry barberries, and I put that in my meal as well, there is one spice, an Indian spice, that has, and barberries is like near the top. It's gooseberry. It's gooseberry. It's amla. And yes. you can get the whole fruit. You don't have to use a powder. It actually, in Indian markets, They'll have, they're like sour apples, little apples, and that's available too. Yeah, okay, the goose, thank you, the Indian gooseberry. That's exactly it. I got the powder, I also got the fruit, but it came all dry and it was so hard, like, like I hurt. But, so <laughs> it, I'm sure. It's available frozen. Okay, uh, so I, I shake a little bit of that in uh, as well, because that, I don't know about the powder form per se, but that has like 10 times more antioxidants than barberries. That was like number one or <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Do you recommend any supplements as a B12 or iron? Yes, I recommend B12 to all my patients um, because eating this way is incredibly nutrient dense, but the one nutrient it's missing is B12. And B12 lives in the soil uh, made by microorganisms. And um, you know now we don't get it if you plant based diet because we wash the fruits and vegetables so much. Animals get it because they eat other animals or eat dirt. Uh, so, but if you don't have, there's, there's a disease called pernicious anemia where someone may not be able to absorb B12, but that's not related to how you're eating. But assuming you don't have that uncommon condition, you typically have a two to three year store of B12 in your body. So you don't have to like rush to the store to get B12. But I encourage our patients to have 500 micrograms of B12 three times a week. And then I'll titrate it uh, from there based on love. That's the only supplement I recommend um, for my patients. Uh, which form? Um, uh, yeah, um, anything, uh, which form of B12 is the question? Anything you want to take. Like, I don't really, I mean, like, methylcobalamin or cyanocobalamin. I guess I, I, I do lean toward the methylcobalamin one, and I think the sublingual <coughs> one is better absorbed, but I'm more interested in them getting one that they'll reliably take. So, whatever, because sometimes it's hard to find one or the other. So, but it would be the methyl sublingual if I could, like, you know, construct it fully. Uh, yes, sir. So I have two questions. I would love for you to address one or both. The first is um, addressing the, the lower nutrient density in our plants that we're buying from the store. And, you know, that five-a-day recommendation, is that truly enough? And with my patients, we usually try to bridge that gap with recommending juicing, which then loses the fiber. I know you were raving with Dr. Colin Campbell's study about the fiber which you lose. And then even supplementing with powders where you lose the water and the fiber both. So, you know, that's one question. And then the second, somewhat unrelated, could you address the new amazing Netflix documentary, What the Health, and your opinions as an intelligent physician on that? You're generous. Uh, but so in terms of the um, servings of fruits and vegetables a day, that five-a-day program, that was just a federal recommendation from a number of years ago. I encourage my patients to have at least three servings of green leafy vegetables a day, three servings of food a day, three servings of other vegetables each day. Um, so the more, the better, really. Um, now, you're absolutely right that the nutrient density and composition of our soil, and hence our vegetables and fruits, has changed probably much to the worse. Pesticides, over farming, it just basically leaches the soil of its nutrients. So, I mean, if someone has the ability to grow their own food or to know a small local farm or an organic farm, it doesn't come up a lot in the Bronx. 
um, you know, that would be great. And I do think that that would be much more nutrient dense in a way that I wouldn't be able to quantify from an epidemiologic study, but I bet if you got like a gas chromographer, uh, GC, I forgot the exact thing, but if you put it through a special molecular analysis, it probably would be more nutrient dense. So I think if you can do that, that would be great. In terms of juicing, I do encourage patients to uh, steer clear of juices, but stick to, to smoothies if they're going to do that. And the reason is because there's more fiber, less of an insulin spike, the, the, the smoothies at least keep the fiber. So I encourage that, I, I kind of discourage juicing. Um, in, in terms of what the health, um, I know a lot of people who are in it, and I actually was going to go to the initial screening in New York City, but I was so busy on service that I could only make it to the, the event after. So I haven't actually seen it yet. <laughs> I don't know. But um, I, I know the number of the doctors in it and their message. Uh, so what I've heard is that it's excellent. It is really great. Um, and it's a wonderful addition to Forks Over Knives. The Forks Over Knives is, from what I've heard about discussions, maybe a little bit more steeped in evidence and a little more somber in tone, and the what the health may be a little bit more shocking in its presentation, um, but I think is a wonderful uh, addition. And from what I know of the docs who are in it, I think it's gonna be incredibly evidence-based, but in all transparency, I haven't seen it yet. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, do you have a number of patients that this does not work for if they adopt the plant-based diet and still have high cholesterol? Yeah, um, the question is, are there patients where I have seen like not having, how do I seem to have not had benefits? Um, I've seen that in two general areas. One on rare occasions is weight loss, and one on rare occasions is cholesterol. But even if they don't have benefits in those areas, I'm very confident and happy that they're probably getting benefits in all kinds of other areas, so I don't let that dissuade me at all. Um, now, the weight loss one, I'm not quite sure how to explain this, but I've seen this only in women, but there's a small percentage of women who they say they go truly whole food plant-based and they're limiting oils because they're incredibly calorically dense, who haven't lost weight. And I talked to Jane Esselstyn about that, called Lost Esselstyn's son, she's a nurse, and she's seen the same thing, and what, in that situation, what she recommended was cutting back, if they're eating more calorically dense things like nuts, avocados, grains, and nut milks, to cut back on that, to having more of the fruits and vegetables. Um, and so I've tried that in a couple of women where this has been an issue, and then the weight loss started happening. There's one person, what I, so what I recommend is, okay, cut that in half. If you're having eight nuts a day, have four. You know, just basically cut those stuff, that stuff in half. And there's one person that I had to like, almost eliminate that stuff, and then the weight loss came off. So that's, that's, but that's an uncommon thing. If people stick to this, and particularly it's very important that they limit oil a lot um, in terms of the weight. Uh, weight usually flies off of them more quickly in men, uh, but it definitely happens a lot in women as well. Um, and um, yeah, so then cholesterol, you know, cholesterol lifestyle matters, but genes do matter too. There's some people who have some genetic conditions that keep their cholesterol high. And even if they're eating a plant-based diet, you know, it doesn't fall. And I do think we each have our genetic floor, um, that some may be higher than others. And it's probable that even if your cholesterol is high when you're eating this way, your cholesterol particles become healthier and less able to cause trouble. Uh, so, uh, so I'm, um, I've seen that a couple of times, but I, I think there's, but that doesn't dissuade you from pushing ahead with patients doing it. Yes, ma'am. Um, going to back to my for someone who has high um, How do you handle dietary restrictions or allergies? Sometimes that can be a real problem. Um, and uh, you know, you do the best you can. You want to first make sure it's a real allergy. Sometimes these things get mislabeled. But if it truly is a real allergy, you know, first do no harm. 
Um, and so what we try to do is, you know, we steer clear of the foods that they're allergic to, um, any more of the other ones. But if it's so restricted uh, that they're just not able to function, you know, then of course, you know, have more animal-based products. You kind of have to, to deal with the situation at hand. I only have like, one or two patients who have so many allergies, that it's just really not tenable uh, for them. And usually it's, it's a, not too bad to work around, um, but it's an important thing. Yes, ma'am. Have you seen any effects on asthma? I know it's cardiac, but asthma rates since yes. you're in. Have you seen effects on asthma? Uh, absolutely. <coughs> um, there's data that a plant-based diet can reduce asthma, improve it. If people are admitted to the hospital for asthma, if they go on a plant-based diet after, they're less likely to be admitted to the hospital. Um, and they may be less likely to get it as a child, being more of a plant-based diet. It's tightly linked to um, dairy. So yeah, uh, I mean, I have seen associations of improvements with asthma. And actually, Gregor, Michael Gregor, on his nutritionfacts.org website has a number of videos, and he has all the references in the video about it. Yes, ma'am. Um, as a follow-on to the question about cholesterol, what changes would you recommend to someone whose triglycerides have gone up after adopting a plant-based diet? Yeah, so um, the, some things that come to mind is first, is it real? Uh, triglycerides are bounce around a lot right after eating. And so first, be sure it's a fasting, <coughs> fasting sample. If someone had some wine or alcohol the night before, that could push up levels, so you want to be sure it was done fasting, not wine and alcohol. If, you, if someone had a simple carbs, like a cake or something like that, that can translate, push it up high. So you want to be sure it's done outside of that milieu. Now, if, it, if it's truly done outside of that milieu, and they're eating a plant-based diet. One thing, exercise can be very important. Uh, triglycerides are particularly amenable to falling with exercise. And you just want to be sure that it's truly a whole food, plant-based diet. And usually after that, sometimes I will have some patients where their triglyceride levels are around 140, 150 when eating this way. Um, but their LDL plummets and they have all kinds of other um, benefits. And so, and, and you know, it's not a, Technically elevated triglyceride level. Thank you. Sure. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned some of the nutrients coming from soil. Is there any studies about hydroponic plants that are grown in water if they have less nutrients? That's a good question. I, I, I do not have, I don't have an answer. Yes, ma'am. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on the aspect of using olive oil? We spoke about nutrient density, of course, and it's not good for weight loss, but only level of inflammation. Yes. Because people use canola oil and all those more beneficial oils, but I know in the plant-based world it's not. Yeah, so the question is about oil, particularly olive oil. Um, this is a more controversial topic, and I, uh, I don't go to the mat on it because the data isn't that strong for me, but I, uh, I encourage patients to not have oil, including olive oil, and I'll explain why. But the first thing I should say is I do not want perfection to the enemy of good. So if someone wants to go 50% plant-based, I'll take it, it's better than 10%. So the, why do I encourage people to not have oil? Uh, the first reason is you take a perfectly good olive with all of its phytonutrients and fiber, you suck out all the fat, you leave that all behind, all you have is a pile of fat with very, very few nutrients. It's, incredi it's incredibly calorically dense, 120 calories per tablespoon. And at least where I work, weight is an issue. Um, um, weight loss is an issue. You see what people do with their salads, right? They get a salad, they put their oil on and talk to their friend. And next thing you know, it's a ton of tablespoons. That's a lot of calories. Um, and so there are studies done by Dr. Vogel, it's very interesting, where he looked at blood vessel function. I didn't have time to get into those studies today. Where he looks at blood vessel function. And he found that if you ate a salad, not surprisingly, your blood vessel function improved transiently. But if you put olive oil, on that salad, your blood vessel function did not improve anywhere near as much. So it's like the oil is mitigating the beneficial impact of the salad. So, and anecdotally speaking, in my patients who have the most obscene turnarounds you've ever seen, 
you know, like begging them to have bypass surgery, they don't want it. Including going plant-based, they also have no oil. They're the ones who have the most obscene turnarounds. So that's my opinion. There's some evidence leading that way, but there's also evidence that having more healthful vegetable oils, like olive oil, canola oil, may be beneficial. And more strict guidelines recommend a little bit of that. So I do encourage my patients to not have it because of, of the concerns I just mentioned, uh, but I don't fully go to the map on it. We have time for one more question. Do, uh, yes, ma'am. Does that include cold parts and oils that are not denatured or broken down by heat? Well, yeah, cooking with oil can be bad because it messes with its molecular structure. No, I'm talking about production. No, oh, well, I mean, I don't, I, I definitely don't have a good, good background in the chemistry of the of how they make oil, but what I can tell you, at least in Dr. Vogel's study, they used extra virgin olive oil. Um, and, you know, maybe it wasn't perfectly extra, the extra virgin olive oil, so there could have been some contamination in that, but at least they tried to use extra virgin olive oil in the studies where we found that worsened endothelial function. The reason I'm asking is because a lot of our, our, our supplements are cold pressed without heat and like or cod liver oils in our uh, human seed oil and all of that and that they're promoting those for anti-inflammatory and, and anti-cardiovascular problems. So if you're telling us to take those supplements off which has the omega-3 and the different you know fatty acids which also they say are healthy for us, I'm finding it kind of contradictory. Right, so, right, so the omega-3 fats are incredibly important. And we have touched on that. I won't take too much of that into it, but you can buy, I encourage our patients to have two human tablespoons of hemp seeds, chia seeds, or flaxseed meal each day, which give people the raw material to make the omega-3 fats. Um, and so they're very important. And it's not a no-fat diet, it's just a low-fat diet. And if someone feels strongly that they need more omega-3s for whatever reason, there are allergy-based supplements that they can take. Thank you very much. Thank Amazing you. presentation.